So during the next time, this will be our uh, opportunity to come forward uh, to have people pray for you. If you're not comfortable with people coming around you to be prayed for, just put your hand up and the congregation will pray for you. So it won't be quite as personal as we're used to, but just so we have that opportunity. So we want to keep that something uh, unique, I think, that we do here at Shoreline. So we want to try and keep that going uh, as we go through this.
the canvas and the At this point, we want to give uh, an opportunity for all of us here to share some God sightings. What I'm going to do is I'm going to try to repeat what you say, condense it. So if I, if I don't say it, uh, communicate it well, feel free to say, Blue, hey, this is what I meant. So that way people can hear us uh, who are on Facebook as we're trying to get Facebook work today. Um, so well, the God, God sightings are simply our events that cause us to give God praise and thanks. Kind of short and simple. Um, I know I'm springing this on you a little bit. And I'll do this a little bit each week. I'm going to keep it timed because every, sometimes when we haven't been together, people share for a long time, and then I don't get to preach. And I know you'd be upset, son. You'd just go home disappointed. Um, but anybody, some God sightings. Again, uh, maybe how you've seen God show up over this very unique experience. So kind of very different. Yes, sir. Let's just stand up, please, and turn and look toward them so you can hear your voice. Okay, that's right. So Jesus is in the house for you. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, we've been struggling about whether or not Cindy should say that this is really her first time. Or not. Yeah, she felt like that was kind of a nod. Yeah, we should, yeah, you should say these things. Mm-hmm. Oh. Well, praise the Lord. Yeah. Anybody else? More than once. So plan for next week. Think ahead about that. Just think through, hey, what are the things that have really stood out? I know some of us are really kind of quiet and shy. That's actually my personality type, believe it or not. Uh, and so it is. Don't smile and laugh. And uh, it actually is. And so, uh, again, just maybe write some things down. That's what I do. And, uh, and just feel free to share. Uh, we'll, we'll get into that again next week. Also, if on the, um, once you get home, there's a talk sheet on the, on the Facebook page. I encourage you to get it out. Well, it started out as a study guide for this sermon, and it became three different devotionals for this sermon. So there's some great questions in there uh, because it's great scripture. It's just good, good scripture. Um, well, way back in the day, way back in the day, um, the Garden of Eden, Eden was created as a place for, for mankind to enjoy being in a right relationship with others, right relationship with creation, right relationship with God. And that world wasn't only just good. It was great. I, I can't imagine how awesome it was. And since mankind rejected God's best for what we thought was better, and we still do that today, we had a deal with a fallen world, a world that's different, a world that's separated from what it was intended to be. And the fruits of this estrangement are things like hostility, indifference, you know, uh, prejudice, and that gnawing feeling in your gut that it's not the way it's supposed to be. You ever had that feeling like this? There's more. There's got to be more to this. Because there is. And I'm not saying things aren't great in this world. Man, I, I, I love my life, and it's great to be on, on line with the people at home, and it's great to be together with you guys with some faces here. Uh, that's great. Not that you're just, not just faces, but people to interact with. Um, and uh, that's just awesome. As I was spending some time in Scripture this last week, just spent time with Jesus, God raised a thought in my mind, and this was it, is life is a journey to regain what was lost while taking as many people with you as possible. Life is a journey to regain what was lost, the original what was in creation, that right relationship, and take as many people with us as possible. And what happens is God draws us to that point of salvation, and he leads us throughout our lifetime till we finally become like Jesus when we meet him face to face. 
Philippians 1, 6, out of the message translation. I, I, I've never read it out of the message translation. It says this, There has never been the slightest doubt in my mind that the God who started this great work in you would keep at it and bring it to a flourishing finish on the very day that Christ appears. He's in this process of bringing us back into that right relationship, back to what it was originally intended to be. And from the moment that mankind rejected God's best, God has been in the process of restoring us back to that perfect, sanctified, holy, perfect world. And the question for us today is this. Right now in our current situation, and all of our situations are different, there's a basic common denominator we all share, but it's all a little bit different for each of us. Right now in our current situation, how can I, how can we partner with the Holy Spirit to be part of that restoration plan? How do we partner with Him in that plan, what He's doing? And, well, I don't completely know what the answer is. You know, in this particular situation, it's kind of interesting. Um, I do know someone who serves as an example for each of us to follow. We can look at his example, and that gives us our direction. I, this is good. It says, Jesus is a bold, reckless, fearless, and daring example of compassion and action. He's a bold. He was reckless. And a lot of what he did, he just stepped right out there. And you'll see some of that recklessness today, what appears to be reckless. He's an example of what it meant to be compassionate. Not just what he said, but what he did. That's what made him stand out from the teachers of his day. He actually did what he said. And what he did is he, he really opened the door from a black and white world to really the world he wants us to be and become through his son Jesus. In a world that rejects the inferior, those alienated by their sin or their situation. Jesus is the keystone. He's the one who holds everything together for mankind to get back to where we're created to be. So life is really a process of getting back to what we're really created to be. You know, that's just amazing for me. Um, so join me as you look, you look at the book of Mark. There's not Bibles in the back, so I apologize for that. Uh, it's just what, what we're doing in our, during this time. Uh, but the book of Mark... And Jesus, we're going to look at here, is how did Jesus reach out to those who were separated, those who were alienated by their sin and situation? We kind of look for him as an example. Because again, when compassion and forgiveness are put into action, they bring hope to the hopeless. Bring hope to the hopeless. And there's a lot of stories I could pick from. There's some great true stories in Scripture. How about Jesus reaches out to those who are alienated, those who are uh, the needed compassion. The Samaritan woman and the Roman, centur uh, the Roman centurion, the official, they were estranged and separated in that culture because of their race. The disciples were looked down because they were looked at kind of like country hicks. They weren't intelligent. They were up there from the hick country up in Nazareth, in Galilee. Women in his day were pretty much viewed as property or, or people who got things done. They were owned in a lot of ways and to be used. What does Jesus do? He becomes part of the followers. The women were there. And they were active. And the list goes on. And today I want to have us just look at how Jesus lived and reached out to those who were alienated by his society so that we can learn to do the same. So we'll go to Mark chapter 2. It's the second book in the New Testament, one of those easier ones to find. And we'll walk through this together. First example is the man with leprosy, the man with leprosy. And if you're in there in chapter 2, just, I'm going to go up, I'm going to kind of set up. Really, this is coming out of a little bit earlier here in chapter 1. But let me set the context. The context is this. Uh, scripture says that Jesus had just had a long day of, of ministry. It was just cooking. Everybody was showing up there in Capernaum to see Jesus. And it appears that they're at, they're at Peter's mother-in-law's house or Peter's house. We don't know which. So after a long day of ministry and, and, a, and a not much rest, Jesus gets up early in the morning to go off by himself, it says, to pray. And while he's out there praying, kind of, kind of getting away and kind of getting his focus by being with his father, Peter shows up with some of his buddies and says, hey, you've you got to get back to the house, man. Everybody's showing up. You will not believe all the people at the house. The whole town has showed up. And Capernaum would have been a pretty good-sized town. Well, Jesus' response there, you look, in verse 38, to Peter is saying, well, let's go somewhere else. 
which doesn't make sense to me in ministry because, hey, everybody's there. No, he says, let's go somewhere else. And he began to go to those nearby villages around the Sea of Galilee to begin to share his message with them. And then in verse 40, we see where the story gets interesting. While he's traveling, hitting these different places, a man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees, if you're willing, you can make me clean. You can cleanse me. What's interesting, when you look at the story in, in, in other books, in, in the book of Luke, he gives a little more detail. He says this particular leper was covered with leprosy. So I don't know what stage of leprosy. I get some different pictures to see different stages. So I don't know what stage it was, but the way it's discovered, this guy was not just a light case. He was just completely consumed by it. And in Jesus' day, leprosy was one of those diseases that was most feared. It could easily be transmitted both by touch and also by, uh, by, through the air. And there's still no cure for leprosy. There's treatment for leprosy, so it doesn't get worse, but there's no cure for that. And what happens with leprosy is it develops these tumor-like, which you can see on the gentleman's face, uh, the, this tumor-like swelling on the outside of the body. And over a period of time as that swells and as that kind of festers, especially in the appendages, the fingers, nose, ears, and toes, they fall off. The appendages begin to fall off. You can see some example of that there in the worst case there. And, and the smell of that flesh decaying was horrible. It was, it was you know, it, you, you would know if someone, a leper was near you, especially when it was a highly developed case like this one. What was interesting, which I never knew before, is that leprosy isn't always about the skin. In the later stages, what it does is it begins to work into your, into your organs, into your bones. And the person ends up dying mainly because of other diseases, because the immune system is so broken down by fighting all this other stuff that something else tends to kill them. Lepers, they're, what they were supposed to do in that culture, and I won't take you there, all Leviticus 13 is talking about is leprosy. Check it out sometime. I didn't realize how long that was. So I just read a little bit and said, okay, I catch it. Stay away from lepers. You know, his point. But lepers, according to Leviticus chapter 13, were to separate themselves from society. They were to become a, a, probably a separate society within the larger society. They were not allowed in the synagogue or church, that's what we would say today, or the temple. So a leper would lose their occupation, their dignity, and their families. Interestingly enough, this is kind of, kind of crazy, um, lepers were also supposed to say how many feet you think away from others. Six feet. I don't know where they got that from. I don't know where our guys got it from, but that's interesting in Scripture. Now, on windy days, it was 150 feet. This is spreading. Again, lepers were supposed to quarantine themselves, not just for 14 days like COVID-19 here, but for their lifetime. Can you imagine the emotional, physical, and spiritual pain that those people endured? So in this true story here, if you continue to look there in the Scripture, the leper, this leper, this individual comes up and he breaks all the social distancing rules. He comes up to Jesus, he humbles himself, and he kneels before Jesus. And again, if you can continue to look in the text as we're going through here, or again, we're in that last part of chapter 1. It's amazing what he says. He says, if you're willing, you can make me clean. That's faith. He's not questioning whether Jesus can heal him. He's questioning whether, whether it's really Jesus as well. If, if you're willing, you can do this. And he acknowledges Jesus as Savior and King by his posture, his physical posture. And he demonstrates his faith. So as you look at this leper, physically, his life was a wreck. And this is my, my, my interpretation. Spiritually, there was something solid there because of how he handled the situation. So I want to have you ask yourself a question here. And I just want you to think about this. I'll have you talk amongst yourself. I'll do that. Okay, you're with some people there. You can talk amongst yourself here. How would you have responded and talk about it at home, there on the couch? Um, how would you have responded when the leper failed to obey the social distancing rules of his day? You're standing next to Jesus, and this leper dude walks up. 
how would you have responded? Talking about it amongst yourselves. Mary had a great conversation. <laughs> I know I'm just teasing. You're by yourself. I'm just teasing. What would you, what would you have done? Think about it, honestly. Put yourself into their sandals. You know what the people in their day did? What they were supposed to, at least according, again, according to going back to the Old Testament, they were supposed to take rocks and sticks and pelt the people and drive them away. But look at verses 41 and 42. Scripture says, Jesus was indignant. He reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately the lepr leprosy left him and he was cleansed. If you look in your Bibles, and I'm, I'm, boy, I miss those Bibles being in here, uh, so be sure to bring Bibles with you. Um, if you notice, beside the word indignant in your Bible, what you'll see is there's a little footnote. There's, in mine, it has a little letter B, which means you go over and find the letter B in the, over here, either at the bottom of the page or on the side of the page. And what it says is this. It says some of the earliest copies of Scripture had Jesus was still compassion. So I kind of put those two together, and I thought, really, how did Jesus respond here? I think, one, I think he was indignant toward his followers and compassionate to the leper. Indignant because of the lack of compassion for the lepers. I think Jesus' disciples got out of Dodge. You know, and Jesus is probably there by himself now, you know. I think that's what happened, because that's what they did in their culture. And he was indignant at them because they failed to see the person beneath the skin. They failed to see who this person really was. He was compassionate to the leper, which is why, which is why I see there's those kind of two words there, because of his pain and because of his faith. And then Jesus does a remarkable thing. He breaks all the social distancing rules. I mean, he even goes down the wrong aisle at Walmart. He goes down, he goes against the arrows here. Um, which you get dirty looks for. I've gotten a couple dirty looks. Um, they can't see my face, so they can't see that I'm smiling at them, laughing, but that's keep going. Um, or my, um, he breaks all the rules. And uh, he reaches out and touches someone who is deemed untouchable. You didn't even get within six feet of this person on a, on a good day. And he touches them. And what's remarkable, we don't catch this. I wish we could. Think about those pictures of the lepers. It says, Jesus healed the man's disease immediately. So picture that worst picture up there. Basically, everything's red. And the nose is not there. Jesus touches him and heals him. Immediately, there's a nose. The skin is nice and, and soft. It's supple. It's way, you know, way skin, perfectly healthy skin. I'm thinking, what, what was that like? I never thought about what it would look like until I worked on this talk. I thought, man, that had to be amazing. And this morning, how do you treat those who are alienated and discriminated against because of their situation? Maybe it's that kid at school. Maybe it's that person at work that drives you nuts who makes the staff meetings go real long, okay? Um, uh, maybe there's someone of a different race, different background, I don't know. But in light of Jesus' example, how should you respond? I want you to think about that. Think, we're thinking application here, because you probably know these stories very well. But we don't always think about how they apply. And what does God need to change in your heart to change your actions? See, our culture says change the actions. It doesn't work that way. If the heart doesn't change, the actions will go right back to where they used to be. If there's no Jesus, there's no change. If there's no change, we'll always be where we're at. So what does God need to change in your heart? Is it an attitude? Is it a prejudice? Is it something maybe it was passed down? Is it something? I don't know. And then how can you better engage those who are different than you? Why? So you can see them as they really are. 
I think we miss some of the richest relationships in our lives because we don't look at the person hard enough. We don't look at them through Jesus' eyes. That's probably the better way to say it. We miss out on some great relationships. And more importantly, we miss out on representing Jesus well to people who are alienated. Well, the second example is how Jesus heals the paralyzed man. And I don't have time to go into this story. Uh, I, I, there's no way I can cover all that. Um, but if you go on over here in, uh, in verses 1 through 4 of chapter 2, uh, the context is this. Is now there's still, he still stays in Capernaum. He, he has been around to some different towns. He returns to the big city. That had been the big city along the Sea of Galilee. He goes back to Chicago, goes back to Detroit, whatever, Cleveland. He ha- goes back to there. And he returns there. And the people hear he's home. So everybody shows up again. They're starting to pack out the house again. And there's so many people. And again, the best assumption is that he's in Peter's house or Peter's mother-in-law's house. We don't know which one. Or maybe they were the same. We don't know. One place in Scripture identifies it as Peter's mother-in-law's house. Other places it doesn't. So I'm not sure which it is. Whatever it was, there's no room in the house anymore. Even outside the door, it says it, it, there was no room. So people were packed in, looking in different ways and standing on, on stools and on each other's shoulders just to see what was going on. And in the midst of that, what you've got to realize is houses back then, this is a little thicker, houses back then obviously had a roof, usually a flat roof, and they usually had some little kind of stairs that would take you up to the roof, mainly because there's more breeze up there. It's a little cooler. It was kind of like, I don't know, what we call our, maybe our, we have our front porches. They had their roofs. You know, that was where a place to kind of get away and be. Well, in this true story, what happens is these four guys show up with their buddy uh, on a stretcher. And he's a paralyzed guy. He, he can't walk. And, and we're not sure how far the paraly- you know, how far it was, paralysis was, but he was paralyzed. And so they can't get him into the door, and they try that, and they go up on the roof. And this is, like, this is a cool story. I love to see Peter's mother-in-law's face. Uh, they rip the roof off in one section and lower him down on ropes, which is an amazing thing, too. That would be scary to be the guy on the thing, trusting your buddies to do it, you know, going all going different ways. And they lower him down. That's the kind of the context. Now look at verse, so, so you're in there, there's Pharisees there, there's all these people are packed in this house, a, a paralyzed guy gets dropped down in front of Jesus. Look at verse 5, look what Jesus does. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. What I thought as I looked at this, I wonder what the crowd was thinking. What are the disciples thinking? What do you think the first thing they thought that Jesus would do? Group participation, healing. I mean, duh, they dropped the paralyzed. It's it's the obvious one. He doesn't do that. And I thought, why? I mean, he could have healed him then, done that. I mean, you know, there's an intentionality there. And the reason why everybody thought, hey, hey, you know, Jesus is going to heal this guy is because they, they could see the outside situation, but they couldn't see his real need. His real need is described really well in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, verses 18 through 19, exactly what Jesus saw. Scripture says this, All this is from God, who reconciled himself, us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God is reconciling the world to himself in Christ. I mean, that restoration project, trying to bring us back to where we were. Not counting men's sins against them, And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. As I thought through application, I think while we're here in this world, man, we need to meet people's needs in Jesus' name, representing Jesus. So it's not building us up like we're really good people, but it's building Jesus up. You know, people understand our motives. But we need to catch that meeting that that obvious need is only the beginning. It's got to go beyond that. That person's real need is to be reconciled to God. That's what Jesus saw. To be brought back into that right relationship that was originally there at creation. Back into a right relationship with God, with others, and with creation. So here's a question I want you to think about. 
You know what the response is. I want you to think with me. A lot of questions today. I want us to think. Who is it in your life that needs to be brought back into a right relationship with God? Stop and think for a second. Who is it in your life, in your sphere of influence, whatever you want, however you want to say that, sphere sounds more you know, intellectual here, um, but in your life that needs to be brought back to God? I don't know, maybe it's a brother. For me, it would be my brother. He just rejected the church, okay? Uh, I don't know who it is for you, but I want you to spend some time this week, okay? Eye contact. This is coaching time here. Uh, I want you to catch, spend some time this week and just ask Jesus to help you see people with their real needs. Help me to see past the outside, you know, which there's some obvious things there. But help me see their real need. God, and pray, God, help me to see, help me to, help me to trust you to change what I cannot. Some of those people that, that, that are in our life like that, we don't think they're, we've tried, you know. I understand that. But you don't give up on. Ask God to change what you cannot. Begin to change their hearts. And the rest follows. And one of the most remarkable ones. Is, is the whole idea here of Jesus reaching out to Matthew. And again, I'm just going through the text, just kind of following along here. We're now in verse 13, I'm just walking through. Um, again, things are still crowded. Um, and so Jesus heads, it's so crowded in the house, so it appears what he does is he gets out of the house and heads to the shore of the sea. There's a little more room, a little more elbow room, a little more people. He can, he can interact with people. Or if you were in a room in a house, a smaller house, you know, you'd see just a few people. So he heads out to along the sea. And as, as he's walking along this, this, the seashore there in Capernaum, he, these, his followers are following him. The crowd's following him. And he notices this guy named Levi, a.k.a. Matthew. That's how we would know him. This man named Levi who's working a toll booth, a tax collecting place. Where the fishermen came in from the shore, that's where they paid their taxes. Look here in uh, verses 13 and 14. It says, once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him, and he began to teach them. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus. We know him as Matthew. Sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him. And Levi got up and followed him. Understand, understand the context. Picture that we've been taken over by the Soviets. And we've been taken over by the Soviets for years. Okay? And that Fred Peterson guy, he went over to the, the Soviets. I, I, you know, I can take on you a little bit just to make this point. And now he's collecting all your taxes. And not only does he collect your taxes, he raises up to get a cut for himself. And when you study Levi, he was underneath another tax collector. They had, a, they had a kind of a system, which is kind of crazy to think about. He had to pay some of the money he collected to his boss. How would you feel toward Fred? And they had a great gig going here. And nothing that people could do about it. In that day, uh, Matthew, would, as a tax collector, would have been barred from attending church. They couldn't testify in a trial. You know why? Because they couldn't trust them. They couldn't be a witness. They were considered, this isn't a nice way to say it, traitorous scum. <laughs> and they were despised for their fellow Jews. When it comes to the fishermen right along the coast, Matthew, Levi, would have been public enemy number one. There's just no question. So a question to think about here. What do you think Jesus' followers in the crowd are thinking as Jesus asks Matthew to join him? <laughs> think about how radical that was. And, and I thought about, you know, what did Jesus see that the others did not? 
And Jesus sees this guy, sees Matthew, sees Levi, and he sees this guy that is tired of his life and he's ready to turn. Probably got a pile of money in front of him, you know, and he's exchanging stuff and taking his money, but he sees him for his need. And when you read the rest about Matthew's life, man, Matthew turns around huge in a major way. And it was scary for him to do that. See, back in that day, if you were a tax collector, it was kind of like the mafia. I have an offer for you, Matthew. You know, and I, you won't refuse. I can't do that very well. Um, but actually, when he left the tax collecting business, there's probably a hit put out on him. You don't leave the mafia. You don't leave the tax collecting job. But this guy risked all this stuff, and he turns around in a major way. He leaves his income. He risks his life. He leaves his friends. And eventually, he's killed for his faith. And what I love about this is Matthew went from, a, from an outcast to a disciple. And he became the writer of that first book of the New Testament, which all of us read today. Amazing. So what did the religious folk of Jesus' this is day, the Pharisees, see when they saw Matthew in the crowd at, at Matthew's party? When you look at the text, they're going, why are you hanging around these sinners? All they could see is sinners in need of rebuke or dis- discipline and punishment. I thought, well, what didn't the religious folk see? What they didn't see is their hypocrisy and their own sin. And we can be like that today. Look at that guy does. I don't, I don't do as much as they do or whatever. We justify what we do. It's hypocrisy. And I thought, what did Jesus see in Matthew that nobody else saw? Jesus saw a sinner in need of grace, just like you and me, before Christ, who had incredible potential for the kingdom. So this morning, oh, sorry, there's my really cool picture. I'm so sorry I got behind. I'm not used to. From the moment that mankind rejected God's best, God has been the process of restoring us back into a right relationship, back to a perfect world. That's what his plans are. And again, I encourage you to check out that talk sheet. And begin to thank you for yourself. Right now in my current situation, you know, whether you're back in school in the fall or not, I don't know. Whether you're, whether you're going back to your work, whatever that situation is. Right now, my current situation, how can I, how can you, how can we partner with the Holy Spirit to be part of that restoration plan? To see people as they are, not as, you know, as they are down here, not their situation. And just enjoy the ride of representing Jesus in our culture which we, Jesus, Jesus needs to be seen right now, right? seen in our culture. There's no question. So again, I encourage you to take the devo- that devotional guide that is, again, on the, on the Facebook page. Download that. There's some good questions to make you think, questions I haven't asked here, um, and, and just to help you work through what, what that Scripture means. I want to compliment you. Uh, you did a great job with Callie expressing your thanks to her uh, for her ministry here with words and actions. Um, that was kind of cool to watch and watch different things and great job giving. And I understand that for many of you, you can go, yeah, go and worship, you can go and get ready. I understand that for many of us during this time, giving back to God at this time seems scary to us. It does. Your fear in, uh, of the future has caused you to do what God wanted a lot of us to do all along. It's called save. <laughs> you, know, you know, we're not so good at that. But it's caused us to save. But again, don't let, your, don't let your insecurity about money keep you from giving back to God a little bit of what He's given to you. Tithing and giving have always been about trusting God. It's not about paying bills. It does pay bills. I know that. But biblically, for us, what it does is it stretches our faith. It increases our trust of God. So I'd encourage you during this very unique time, you know, prayerfully discuss as you may be as you're, if you're by yourself at home or you're an individual, think about it and pray about it. As a family, spend some time discussing that. Husband and wife, decide on what you plan on giving, and then trust God to meet your needs. He's very good at that. Um, 
You can give online, again, through our, for our Facebook page as well as the website. You can give by cash or check. Um, you can either mail that in to the church address. You can Google that and find us that way. Or during the week from 9 to 2, uh, there will be someone here in the office, and you can drop it off that way. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. I thank you for uh, stories that I can kind of remember growing up. I didn't pay much attention when I occasionally went to church, but I kind of remember those stories. But, Father, I thank you for the meaning behind those stories, that those simple stories have profound application to our everyday lives. In a world that's wrestling with uh, discrimination, a world that's wrestling with alienation, in a world that's, that's, that's wrestling with insecurity, um, your example is one who meets those needs. Um, Father, help us be a people that are about that. Not just looking to ourselves, what's best for us, uh, but consider what's best for others and what's best for the kingdom. Thank you for this time to get together, Father. And I give you praise and all the glory.